you know, oxygen heals. That that's proven, right? Yeah. So I believe in that. I think the uh, PRP stuff. There's there's some credibility to it. Stem cells. That's a whole. That's a whole shit show. Are you doing that there too? Really? I'm not doing that there, but I mean, I've been involved with stem cell research since I was uh, like fresh out of college when I was playing basketball in uh, Sweden. Yeah. And I mm. actually worked with the Dr. Wiener is the pioneer in stem cell research. He was the one that first used uh, fetal tissue uh -huh. mm -hmm. for, for stem cell research. And so ironically, and his dad, this is Lund University, his dad was a preacher, an ordained minister, and they literally were fighting each other because, you know, from from uh, an abortionist perspective, and that's, this is when Bush put the moratorium on stem mm -hmm. cell research because mm -hmm. they were using induced abortions for the for the fetal tissue. Oh, I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. There Did you know this, that, Sal? Yeah. yeah. Oh, there wow. This, yeah. There was this crazy, yeah, so there's this crazy debate, and then the pioneer that of this baby. shit was like literally fighting with his dad based on a theological theory. Oh. So that's where I was fascinated because I, you know, I had a background in bioethics. So mm. I got to study under this guy while I was hooping over there. Oh, no um, shit. So I've been wow. involved in that shit. Uh, and now is stem cells like oversold? I mean, I feel like sometimes it's overhyped. Is it yeah. legit or is it mostly like, eh, maybe? What do you think about cord blood? Uh, you know, I know somebody that was involved in that. Yeah. I mean, I like anything from the beginning, right? I mean, yeah. that, that's kind of it. intuitively that's what you think. Um, in terms of like, in, in terms of the context of athletes and injury, for what I what I am involved with, I would I would say that <clears throat> there's certainly a medical marketing now for all kinds of different uh, stem cells. I mean, there's this bullshit about freezing. You know, the frozen stem cells are going to work. I don't think that's going to work. Uh, there's a theory on being able to pull from your hip your own stem cells and injecting that. There's some physicians that say that. I don't necessarily uh, believe in that one. I think it's got to be nascent. And that's why, you know, I think the, the fetal tissue makes sense for mm -hmm. me. But again, I'm, I'm not a scientist. I'm just trying to research as well, you, best I can. You're a good person, though. This is a great place to even start, too, because you're around professional athletes and you have been now for well over a decade. Yeah. What are some of the things that what are the things that have impressed you the most with like speaking to recovery and rehab? Mm, yeah. mm. I would say, honestly, uh, st stem cell is big. PRP is big, hyperbaric, hyperbaric recovery, hyperbaric oxygen is huge. Yeah. I think, I think hyperbarics is one of the most misunderstood things in Western medicine. Um, Western medicine is so slow to predict anything, right? They don't want to ratify anything for years. And yet, uh, and if you talk to a traditional orthopedic surgeon for hyperbaric therapy, they go, oh yeah, yeah, that heals uh, the diabetic's foot. It's for wound healing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, but they don't go, they're not taught to go any further than that. And when you start doing the research, and I've seen clinically, when I see... Uh, I had a, a ball player for, uh, who was a linebacker um, with the Niners busted his ankle. I mean, third degree sprain would have been out for six to eight weeks at a minimum. And uh, the thing was ballooned. He goes into the, I call it the tank, goes into the oxygen chamber. That thing is reduced. The first session, the thing's reduced by 40%. He's back on the field in two weeks. Wow. He was in a contract year, probably made him $15 million. Wow. Um, so that's something that I've seen and I believe in. Yeah. yeah mm -hmm. I, I used to train a lot of uh, doctors and surgeons and uh, I would ask them questions like, what are the, what would be the top three things you would do if you had uh, a cancer that was terminal? There was no traditional methods or whatever hyperbaric chamber always came up because of, of its effects on, on cancer. Mm. Which is fascinating because there's a debate about that. Um, because obviously when you think oxygen heals, you, you question whether, Oh shoot, does that feed the cancer? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. But from whatever research I see, uh, that is not true. And it does in fact attack it. Yeah. Oxygen kills, uh, uh cancer cells from what I've read. Yeah. Mm. So it's like one of the things you could do that's not, you know, chemo or conventional treatment. So it's really interesting. Now, what are like the methods they're using in Panama in terms of stem cell? I know that like that, that's sort of the Mecca now for uh, the new wave of, of stem cell. What, what I understand, uh, again, this goes back to, to U.S. legislation, and, and that's a whole other conversation I don't necessarily want to get into today. But um, from what I understand, one of the reasons why stem cell research in the United States is so slow is because the FDA has jurisdiction on anything that's that's harbored. I mean, anything that you can't you can't store store these cells, for example, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, if you can't do that, uh, you're limited as to what you're allowed to do um, scientifically. Um, and so Panama or, or we hear about athletes going to Germany to get the shot, the quote unquote uh -huh. shot mm -hmm. and things like that. It has everything to do with with U.S. legislation on this topic uh, more than anything else. That's all. That's all okay. I really know about that. Hmm. Interesting. Now, talking about athletes recovery, how many how many of these athletes are that you see 
are doing the right things and how many of because this is what I've ran into. And I've ran into this hanging out with you before, uh, meeting some of this, these pro athletes. And what I was seeing, this was just maybe five, six years ago, I think when you were you and I were hanging out, and I won't roll any professional athletes <laughs> on the bus, but I re- a lot of them tend not to yet, anyway. h- yeah, yeah. H- hire their... Yeah, yeah, not yet. Anybody what? have a drink? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get a little right, further right, this right, conversation. Yeah. You know, uh, a, a lot of them tend to hire their their best friend who went and got certified as a personal trainer. Yeah. Uh, you know, how common is that with these multi-million dollar athletes and how many of them are actually investing like the LeBron James is going out and spending millions of dollars a year on hiring all the experts? It, it's limited. It's limited. It's funny. I, I think I just heard an article about LeBron James eating a bunch of pancakes and all that as part of his fuel, but that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> um, in terms of, you know, it, it's... As an athlete uh, and coming up through literally through childhood, you're, you're such a talent, right? And you're so used to whatever whatever you practice is your habit. So if you're going to eat McDonald's or if you're just going to hang around or just work out every once in a while, that's kind of what you're used to. A lot of these guys are so athletic. Uh, they're so gifted that they, they're not, they don't train themselves to even consider um, things like that, that, what you're talking about, to increase the opportunity for them to be even better. Still today, though, I feel like that's what it was two decades ago when we were all fucking kids. But I feel like the it's we we now see cryotherapy, we see hyperbaric chamber, we see all these things now, and you and you're hearing about more and more people. I feel like, and maybe this is me in my own little bubble because I'm around professionals all the time that are talking about mm-hmm. topics like this. Mm-hmm. Is it really still that small of a percentage are taking advantage or really taking their diet to the next level and their rehab and all that and the recovery? I, I think it's I think what you're really tapping to is is disruption of culture, which mm. takes a long fucking time. If you, let, let's be honest, the majority of, of athletes in the NFL are African American, right? Mm-hmm. If you look at the if you look at the culture, if you look at the type of food uh, that they were quote unquote quote unquote raised on, I mean, grandma, you know, she cooks the she cooks fried chicken, she cooks uh, it's the Kool Aid, it's high sugar content things. Yeah. Um, these are things that they're used to. So it's not only recognizing from a professional perspective that you need to get better and really take a look at your health and diet. It's more embedded in you culturally. It's like, what smells good when I when I go to grandma's house? It's the fried chicken. Well, what do I crave? Fried chicken. I oh. mean, uh, I mean, and look at Mar- uh, Marshawn Lynch. Uh, you know that that quote about, oh, you got to take care take care of y'all's chicken or something like that. I mean, these are things that are embedded in your culture, yeah. right? And so it's it's deeper than just recognizing that you need to feel your body differently. I, I would also imagine that if you're at that level of an athlete. Because uh, I've met a lot, I've worked with athletes, and I know that there's a, a bit of a superstition. Like I don't like to change these socks every time I wear them. I win. Oh, or yeah. So now you got this diet. You've been eating it a particular way. You've crushed in high school, crushed in college, became a pro. Uh, I don't want to change nothing. It's not broken. I'm crushing. Is there a little bit of that mentality? Uh, there's a hundred percent of that mentality. You, I mean, if you speak to any athlete, if a running back has a hundred yard game, he's going to do the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah, <see? laughs> exact same. Thing. Ritual is 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 don't critical. wash his underwear. Ritual is critical. Uh, every every ath- every NFL athlete that I know of has a specific ritual uh, before the night before a game. Uh, as an example, there's a, a receiver that I represent. Every night before a game, and they all they have to go to the hotel, you know, team hotel before the game, obviously mm-hmm. to try not get in trouble. He gets a, a double scoop ice cream sundae, uh, and then a pizza right before midnight, and that that's what he that's and, and the team provides it. The team provides it. I mean, that's what he does. Well, well you know what though? Here's the thing: you don't want to mess with someone's mental state either. If you've yeah. done that yeah, for years, that's a good point. Well, that's got to be that's got to be the, the how do you juggle that, right? How do you juggle? And then how does someone like you, as an agent who's in between, who's like trying to tell him like, hey man, if we took this diet thing a little bit more serious, maybe well, we can- and, and look at that, right? We're going going to your going to what you say. There's a there's a there's a there's a, there's a difference between like look if he's winning, I don't care what you do, whatever. You you did last night like keep going yeah. there's i have a story and this is where we probably uh, start getting in trouble and start getting edited but i don't really care i have a great story about uh, pablo sandoval okay um so pablo sandoval uh, world series mvp third base in the giants we're uh we're <laughs> we have a birthday party and just my luck he they the giants are playing miami so uh and he's like poppy you know you gotta come to my birthday and i'm like great poppy that's like a thousand miles or you know you know thousand miles away i don't yeah. want to go uh, he's like, yes, you're going. And so at the time I was working with him. So yes, I was going. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and we, I mean, we got down, we, we, we had a great birthday. Uh, it was a good time. And I looked at the watch and it was four in the morning and then five in the morning. And then at some point I'm like, dude, we gotta, <laughs> we gotta get back to your hotel. 
You know, he's got a game the next day. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> or the yeah. day of. <laughs> yeah. Day of. Yeah. Literally. So, so we're we're literally we're we're in a car and my my palms start sweating because the last thing I want to do it's it's one thing for like Pablo to walk in there. Yeah. Um, and it is what it is, right? He maybe gets in trouble, maybe doesn't. But for me and Pablo to be seen, the optics of that for a team to see me, that, that's not good. That's not good for business. <laughs> yeah. You know, that's right. not good. You so allowed I'm, this. Yeah. yeah so right? all I'm hoping is that I <laughs> pop out of the car, give him a dap, and I'm, we're out. Yeah. Hop out of the car, give him a dap. There's fucking Bruce Bochy smoking a cigarette saying, <laughs> Jesus Christ, Pablo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And uh, it's just like the worst, the worst possible scenario. Oh my yeah. god! You know how do you so, play? Yeah, hit a hit a donger. Hit, went yard <laughs> oh, <wow>. that <laughs> night. Went yard <laughs> that night. Had a great game. Which goes to my point. It's like, look, sometimes you know you don't know what it is. But oh, yeah. me, Lawrence Taylor he used to show up all fucked up before the game, all night doing whatever he's doing, and then ball the fuck out. Yeah, I don't know. I, I've I, heard stories of Dennis Rodman like that too. Show oh yeah, up to yeah. The, yeah, like like major playoff games and just killing it or, after yeah. a full party. Uh, and let's be honest, when you're dealing with that level of performance, what's more crucial and critical to manage: mental state or nutrition? Honestly. Yeah. Be honest, right? At that point, yeah. At that You're point, at that right? such high level. Yeah, yeah, nutrition and taking care of the body, that is a, that's the long game. That's something that yes. you play for weeks and months and years of consistency, and you don't see the real benefits until months and years mm. later, yeah. where when you're talking about the moment, you know, the night, I get the phone call, you know, what you have him eat that night is really not going to make a fucking no, huge and difference. Especially if you if you get them out of the routine, spook them a little bit, like, mm. oh shit, I didn't do my normal pizza at midnight or whatever. Then they play and they suck. Never again. Yeah. They're never going to do what you told them again. They're going to go back to their pizza. I, I got to talk to you. Even... Yeah, I got to talk to you about, uh, you know, the Raiders moving to Las Vegas oh, sure. and like what kind of potential things you see happening in terms of like from an agent perspective, from a manager perspective, like how are they going to be able to control or like keep, uh, you know, the team <laughs> together? <laughs> Oh man, that's a loaded question. I mean, <laughs> it's something that they're concerned about. It's something we're all concerned about. Um, look, Vegas. I mean, uh, uh, here's another uh, tidbit on a story. I had a, I had a, a kid out of a San Jose State receiver. Um, I'll, I'll limit it to there because I've represented a couple of receivers from San Jose State. So that's okay. <laughs> uh, the kid was a, a drafted a draft guy. Got his signing bonus. Uh, told me that he wanted to go to Vegas. I said, okay, that's fine. Uh, Sunday night, I get a phone call. Hey, I need a, you know, I need a, I need, can I get like 10, like 10, what? <laughs> 10 racks, 10 racks. <laughs> you just got your SB, your signing bonus, man. It's been a weekend. The guy blew <laughs> oh my through God. his signing bonus throughout the weekend. Now in other areas, in other places in the country, you couldn't even do that, that would be crazy, right? Yeah. In Vegas, that makes you sense. can easily do 300 grand or 400 grand in a weekend, like very easily. Your boys are in town. There's 25 people. You got the pool party. You got, well, Friday night, you got a table service, mm -hmm. right? That's probably at least 10 or 15 grand. Then you got the pool party Saturday. Don't forget about the pool party. That's 20 grand. Yeah. Then you got take everybody eat. That's another 10 grand. Yeah. Then you want to go big Saturday night. So that's the 40 grand table. Yeah. Because right? oh, that's yeah. extra bottles. Yeah. <laughs> and then you gamble a little bit, you know, and you lose. Just lose track. It's yeah. not that hard. Yeah. It's Holy not. Isn't that, that the main reason man. why they have uh, have avoided sports teams there for so long? Isn't that part of the reason why? Is that uh, true? Yeah. I mean, my whole theory on that is that there's two. They see the league sees two major opportunities uh, in the next you know twenty to thirty years to make yeah. money. Number one, uh, weed and gambling. Yeah, weed yeah. and gambling. This was all. This don't think that this just came up overnight. Mm. Um, I had a there was a competition. There was an arm wrestling competition. I don't know if remember you guys uh, if you guys remember this type of thing, but there's a thing where NFL players would compete against NFL players and then uh, be guided by professional arm wrestlers. What? Yeah, I, I don't see that. And so there was a there was a thing on CBS last year. I forget the name of it, but it was on CBS. Mm. Um, and so I got called, asked if I could seed any of the players, and they're offering some good money for this, right? And so, uh, so I, I had about five or six guys go down there and we spent a week in Vegas, which was a disaster. I will never spend another a week in Vegas. Two <laughs> days is my limit. Long. <laughs> two days is my limit. We were having 42 for breakfast. It got bad, oh. you know? Um, but it, what happened was these guys all got paid. Uh, CBS ran the production and they got a call from the, um, from the NFL saying they're going to, uh, they're going to fine every player that participated. Um, in the arm wrestling tournament because it was held on a property, a casino property. 
and they did not want them affiliated with with casinos. Oh, oh interesting. Wow. Now, Holy shit. Yeah, yeah. But what happened is even it's even funnier. So what happened is CBS is is a part like a major partner, right? And CBS goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're 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 gonna show this. And no, no, we're not, we're not gonna do that. The fines went away. Oh, just oh, went away. Okay. Fines yeah. went away. <laughs> interesting. So so back to your point with, with Vegas and the Raiders and what's going on. Look. I mean, come on, the negotiated CBA right now, there's some stories about the CBA, you know, being negotiated right now. Uh, the union's trying to negotiate with ownership right now. And right now, sponsorships are allowed with casinos uh, for for teams, for stadiums, right? Well, mm. Why aren't coaches and players allowed to acquire sponsorship? Oh, wow. It's still illegal. I wonder why. Because the league sees gambling again and cannabis as two opportunities to make a lot of money in the next 20 or 30 years mm. is there potential like conflict like okay if if, yeah, if the sports player betting. yeah was sports yeah. betting could throw a game or something the like that or is Pete that Rose not really an issue? issue well i mean i've i've personally you know when i was playing at uh northwestern when i played football at northwestern university every year the fbi would come in and talk with us um and the reason is the reason is we had we had a former teammate that accidentally fumbled uh, uh against ohio state um, he got he got ten years. Um, what? We, got, we had a we had a ball player uh, missed a couple free throws. He got three years, and so after that, Shy Town. I mean, come on, Shy Town. Well, how can they prove that? Well, uh, when you're it's when, convenient when it just moves over the line. Yeah, go I mean, check out, if it's go, obvious. Go right? check out Northwestern Ohio State. I think it was ninety. Wow, it must have been real obvious. We were yeah. at the goal line. Okay, we we're at the goal line, and and. There's no way that you fumble he just that ball. Coughs it. Yeah, right you don't fumble oh, that yeah, ball. Come like on, guy. That. You yeah. don't do that. No. Um, Especially when it's right on the Vegas line, right? Yeah. That's oh, yeah. yeah. So, you start looking at this. Yeah. So the FBI would always come and address, like, mm. hey, here's the deal. And and here's how deep it goes. You can't tell your friends how practice went, okay? If they're asking you how, you know, at that time, Darnell oh. Autry was a running back, if he's hurt, you can't tell them that he's hurt. That's insider information. Right. That's of course. insider information. So, so it's pervasive, uh, and goes to your, to your point. Sure, is there an ostensible conflict? Yeah, but I mean, come on. If if the teams, you, dude, have you heard what's going on in that stadium with the Raiders? No. 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 Oh man, I mean, it's gonna be. I know they have like a jail on site. Well, which is smart. <laughs> yeah. What I hear is there's, you know, those those buttons you can you can press and the and the the glass kind of flashes so you can't see into the suites. Yeah, yeah. They have those things. They have stripper pools. Uh, you <laughs> no, have, they you don't. Have, that, oh that's God. what I'm hearing. Vegas, dude. Come that's on. what I'm hearing. Yeah. You're, uh, can you gamble there? You should be able to gamble there if you're in a suite, right? Oh my God. You might you? be able to because there's no tailgating. Um, the whole thing, the whole thing about the league is they're trying to get people to come to the to come into the stadium quicker, right? Because you sell more beer and you sell all wow. that stuff. So anything to get them into the state of more. That's why, you know, the Chicago Bears, for example, one of the first teams that, that banned tailgating and everybody is pissed off about it. Well, why are they banning that? They want them in the stadium. Absolutely. A hundred percent. So now there's talk that you might be able to stay the night before in the oh, stadium. Wow. Oh, you don't right. know. What time are the gates going to open? We don't know. It's Vegas. It's always open. <laughs> Wow. This sound like Biff. You remember from the Back to the Future? Like, oh, yeah. It sounds like one of his ideas. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I drove by that stadium. It's crazy. It looks Have sick. you guys seen it? Yes. Oh, it's it's all sick. blacked out and everything. That's crazy. That's going to be insane. And, and if it if it's successful and they do what you're talking about, mm -hmm. that could potentially set a standard, wouldn't you say? Uh, it, it will. That's what their plan is. That's what I would say. Wow. Oh. So what were you saying about weed in the NFL? What's the yeah, deal there? Yeah, let's talk about You know, it, it's it's... It's troubling to me because right now, as it stands, the union is is negotiating against the owners for a new collective bargaining agreement to extend the you know, labor peace agreement, right? And one of the main topics is cannabis. Um, and right now, uh, if you look at the, what ML, the MLB did, they ratified cannabis completely, right? They took it off the banned substance list. And that's where it should be, by the way. Mm -hmm. In fact, the only argument that I can make for cannabis to be on a banned substance list, if you can argue that it's performance enhancing, right. maybe. Maybe, but nothing, nothing but that. Um, so right now, the, the the way that owners have negotiated is like, look, okay, the way it works today is that players only get tested one time for cannabis, and ironically, you guys could guess the date it actually actually start getting tested. Four twenty. No, no they don't. I no, swear to not. God. Is I swear to God. That's the really? beginning that's of the date because the league year starts in March and it's a message to the players like, hey, if you're smoking, <laughs> just fucking stop for like a couple weeks while you get tested 
and then he can go free, which makes it even more crazy as to why any player would test positive for cannabis. It's like, <laughs> yeah. dude, can't you discipline yourself? Just for- dumb. Just six, like, and and mind you, like, okay, four twenty is when you start, and you still have to get summoned to take the test. So what happens is when you get your pink slip, like, hey, you got to go piss. It's like the winning lottery ticket that these guys have. They are so excited. Because then they can finally start blazing Fuck again. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah. So, so that's how it goes right now. So it starts at 420. When you get tested, you're good to go for the entire year. And guys still get caught. Guys still get caught. And then what happens is if they get caught, uh, the first offense, the team doesn't get notified. The team doesn't get notified, but they get have to be put in what's called the program, which is awful. You have to go to like almost like an AA version, you know. <laughs> oh, you're, you're you have a counselor you have to visit. You have to piss all the time. You're fucked. Yeah, you're man. fucked. And then it's it's when you test twice and you get suspended. Well, then you're just complete. You're, you're kind of a moron yeah. At, yeah. at that point. It's weird because uh, cannabis has some really um, interesting anti-inflammatory effects on the brain. And football, obviously, it's starting to get a little bit of a bad rap with CTE, mm-hmm. cannabis actually is yeah. not, it, it, theoretically, from what the studies I've seen, could be a great way to prevent, you know, those kinds of issues. So a player playing a game, getting battered, blazing up afterwards might actually be a good thing. A hundred percent. And and so, and this is where the union is today with the owner. So that's how it is as of right now. Mm-hmm. What they're negotiating right now, what's on the term sheet is that the, the amount of the time frame for testing, it's still going to be 420. But it's only it's limited to two weeks because right now it, it's that's when they can start testing. But sometimes guys don't get tested till September, mm. right? So they limited to two weeks and they increase the number of nanograms you can have of THC in your system from like thirty to one hundred and fifty. Okay, if if that makes I don't I don't know about that nanogram stuff, but that that's what they use to measure it. I guess is a litmus. Mm-hmm. I, I mm-hmm. We'll go with that. And it's a pee test. Yeah, it's a piss test. Oh, it's man. a piss test. So, but this is bullshit. I mean. Look, the MLB eradicates it. NBA is, you know, has always been, you know, seen it differently. <laughs> yeah. And to your, to what you say, uh, look, there's neurologists out there. There's a whole hell of a lot of studies. These, these cannabinoids, the terps, whatever you want to say, literally can help, help with uh, brain injury. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got to tell you, uh, whether it's college football, high school football, the pros, the amount of pain that football creates. Oh is insane yeah and and for a guy to be i have so many friends that are still hooked on you know the, the vicodin right mm-hmm. it's vicodin 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 you never can kick it like i would much rather promote the positive effects of a plant than and pain management through something like that than synthetic fucking opium right. oh totally and, and if and you're right in terms of the performance i mean i remember when uh, nick diaz got in trouble for smoking yeah. weed in the and I'm like, man, he should get another award if he won that fight <laughs> while he was high. Yeah. I feel like not only do you get the money, but you get a bonus. That's like, amazing. Hey, yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> or, you uh, were stoned and you won. Yeah, or Newcomb. What is it? Newcomb? Who's the guy that pitched on LSD? Was it Newcomb? Oh, oh God. Right. Right? right? I mean, that yeah, should be an that. extra. You should get an extra W for yeah, that. Yeah, it's that, was, <laughs> that was back in the 80s and they were all yeah. free. Yeah. All it is, it is not easy. So what's going on right now with the players? You sent me, you tagged me yeah. in an Instagram uh, post. One of the Steelers uh, was ranting on his Instagram yeah. story. Pouncy, yeah, yeah. Good dude. <laughs> yeah, what's going on right now? So, uh, it it's it's complicated. Um, but this is what's going on. So you have these political, you have political will at hand. On the one hand, you got the NFL, right, and they just want to grind the players. They always tend to win. The NFL mm-hmm. always tends to win against uh, against the union, and and partly the reason is because, um, you know, there there hasn't been an unseating of a union member in in years. In years, there's never been, uh, you know, a vote to to unseat uh what's going on and so what you see is uh, a comfort level between uh this is my opinion a comfort level between the players association ownership to where i don't think they're they're in a position to to fight like they're supposed to fight and negotiate i think it's become too comfortable mm. and you'll see that if if you look at troy vincent and look look that guy up uh, later on troy was a guy who started with the nflpa and now he's with the nfl so there's a, a clear example of well, wait a second, how does that work? Mm-hmm. You know, um, and so I think there's a there's a mass, uh, but the issue is education. There's a mass discontent between um, between players and what the union is negotiating right now. So there's no rule against that. There's no rule against going from one to the other. I mean, that's like somebody uh, you know being the the CEO of you know uh, a major pharmaceutical company and then going and being uh, you know ahead on the FDA. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's something like something doesn't smell right, but there's mm-hmm. nothing illegal about that. It's it's kind of like you know when it's it's a prosecute a prosecutor for years and years prosecutes, and all of a sudden he flips himself and becomes the best defense attorney out there. Right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <And> it's similar <laughs> shit. Wow, very interesting. So you've how long have you represented players for? So I've been licensed since uh, 2003, 2004. So how does bit. one do that? Like, how do you even <laughs> start in that in that in that field? I mean, it seems like such a Especially if you're a sports fanatic and fan, I feel like, and you're not. You watch a Jerry Maguire. That's yeah, it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like see, it looks like it. Oh my God, that would be like the next best thing to being a pro athlete, or maybe even better would be to do that. How the hell do you even get into that? So uh, I think there, there's two routes. Uh, I I personally, I mean, my story is I think unique in that I never wanted, I never wanted to be an agent. I never wanted to be a sports agent. I, I mean, going through, uh, I was blessed enough to have a great college experience. We had to, uh, you know, the Rose Bowl was there, the Citrus Bowl. We got our asses kicked by Peyton Manning, uh, but we had some successful, uh, some successful athletes there, and they got drafted really, really high. Uh, and, and the way it worked for me is that um, a couple of my former teammates literally called me and was like, "Look, we don't, we don't like, you know, we don't like our agent." Um, we don't trust them or a couple other teammates coming. Hey, can you get me in the league? I know that you live right next to Steve Mariucci. Cause at the time this one, Mooch was coaching the Niners and, uh, it, for me, it was a joke. I'm like, yeah, I'll call Mooch. Like, I don't care. Mm-hmm. So I call Mooch and talk about, Hey, a couple of my friends are really good and they, they should get in a camp. And there was this awkward silence on the phone. I've always been cool with Mooch, like great guy. There was this awkward silence on the phone and he goes, are you fucking calling me about getting some fucking players in my phone? fucking camp <laughs> oh, man. And, and this is a guy where he's always been like nice to me like my my brother went to school with adam one of his kids <laughs> like he offended him yeah and i'm like oh fuck like i'm st- i'm sorry like what he's like no no i'm sorry he's like i deal with fucking agents all the time and i'm sorry like he backed up he's like i, I you, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about i can tell <laughs> <laughs> but he's like let me tell you how this works there's only you know i have a limited fucking roster going into camp like we spend hours trying to figure out how we're going to get the most competitive camp uh, out there and so mm. for you to just call and have yeah, a couple my, players yeah, have my buddies yeah, who, who, by the way please. haven't played in two years yeah. <laughs> he's like it's fucking no it's a fucking no he goes but he goes but if you want to try to get him on an arena team this is when the arena team is really good like saber cats were awesome yeah. for a number yeah. of years you know they go, look if you want to get if they get on an arena team i'll take a look at him next year hmm. and so actually i called the saber cats and i called the chicago rush long story short they both get on the team um, now, Mooch still didn't ever let him into camp, <laughs> but what happened with the Sabercats is I got introduced through my my former uh, roommate and teammate, Kevin Buck, to Rashid Davis, and Rashid ended up playing in the with the Chicago Bears for seven years. Um, he just, he balled out, didn't have an agent. I happened to be there. Mm. He saw I was cool, and that that's how it started. So that's how I broke in. It was through pure accident. Wow, nice. wow. Pure and then, accident. And, and, you're, and basically, what makes an agent a good agent mm. versus an agent that's like shit? Like, what makes you good? Yeah. Uh, there's, there's, and I guess are there's, you really good? I mean, I, I still don't know. <laughs> Jury, <laughs> I, jury's I, still I, out. I sit t- so the way this whole thing started, yeah. I, I didn't uh, tell the guys this. So I'm, I'm watching uh, XFL. XFL just, uh, just started up, yeah, right? So I'm watching it. Into that. Yeah. And our uh, mutual friend, uh, Marquette King, I met Marquette through when uh, it was one of his uh, athletes that he represents. Now I know Marquette just came off of uh, some of the best NFL. I mean, he's one of the better punt. He was one of the better punters in the league mm-hmm. uh, the last couple. Couple years, Top five, and, yeah. yeah. Now I see him on XFL, so I send a text message. to This guy, <laughs> like, what's said, happening? No, dude? I say, go. Oh, yeah. hey, are you that shit even agent? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. I get this fucking rant, and then the fuck squeezing out of him. <laughs> you they, they, don't, in they don't call the NFL for nothing. There's a lot of L's in the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> let me tell you. Um, but we could talk about the Marquette. Stuff yeah, we'll later go. If you we'll want. get. We'll get there in a minute. Um, but what makes you a good agent? I think if you had to create some sort of litmus test. Uh, obviously, number one is like how what kind of contracts you've been negotiated, mm-hmm. um, and not necessarily that you negotiated the top contracts. Is when you've been put in a really shitty situation, how did you fare? Um, and and that, I think that that would be the best way to judge what a good agent is. Give me an example of that. When yeah. have you been put in a situation and you you probably saved a guy or gave him some air? Sure, sure. Um, I, I don't know if you guys follow a lot of uh, college football or not, but Chris Brown it was a really, really good running back out of the University of Colorado. Played for the for the Titans for for five years and then the uh, Houston Texans for a couple of years. So eight year back. He was on the Heisman watch list. Uh, that year, Larry Johnson was the only running back that got drafted ahead of him. Right. And so he was having a tremendous year with a uh, tremendous career with the Titans. He had had 1100 yards in like 11 games, hurt his toe. 
Um, and in the NFL, it's it's literally what have you done for me lately? It doesn't matter if you got a thousand yards last year. If you're not in a contract year, it doesn't fucking matter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Um, and so as a young agent, I, I literally, this was kind of like the first big name. He's a starting running back. He's the first big name I could, I could do a deal with. And so we get to, we get to the, uh, the free agent opportunity. He had hurt his toe. Didn't, it was got like 800 yards and I literally called the Titans thinking I'm going to do maybe a 14 to 15 million guaranteed type yeah. contract where it's maybe looks like 40 million in the media type shit. Mm. Yeah. And they go, uh, when now, <laughs> well, he, you know, he's an 850 back. Like he's, I mean, he's run of the mill. Like we're not going to offer any big money here. And I go, oh, man, this isn't, this isn't good. And so I let Chris know like, Hey, you know, what's the offer at? And, uh, I said, well, it's like 300 grand to sign and 700 to play. It's a million Ooh. bucks. And he goes, Oh hell no. You know, uh, -uh, uh, -uh mm -hmm. I'm not doing that. And so when I started calling around the league, the issue was there was an injury prone concern because of the injury. And so in that context, you have to do a prove it deal. You have to show that you're healthy and that you can maintain yourself for 16 games. Um, now, as an athlete, you don't want to hear that. As a running back who, by the way, was, you know, back in the day when John Madden put you on the horse trailer, he was on there. I mean, he was a hot running back just a year before. Right. He's not trying to hear that. So I got put in a really shitty situation. And now he's thinking, well, dude, you're, you're young. Maybe you just don't know what you're doing. Uh -huh. And so uh, it, this went on to where, you know, it got to the point where you never want to do a deal after the draft as an agent, a free agent deal. You never want to do that because you never know in that war room and a blink of an eye, they could say, hey, you know what? We like that other running back. Uh, fuck, you know, fuck Chris. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're getting towards that point. And I knew that you can't do a deal after that. So I was like, Chris, we got to do this deal. Like no other team is out there. Okay. I promise you. No, we're not doing it. And this is the this is the circumstances. Uh, Coach Fisher was a USC guy. You had Norm Chow, who was a USC guy at the time. You had Reggie Bush and Lindell White over at SC, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of worried. I'm like, Chris, you know, they're they're offering you this, but you never know what's going to happen after that. Well, yeah, it's fine. After the draft, when they don't draft a running back, we're going to do a deal. I'm like, all right. So sure enough, draft day comes. Boom, Lindell White drafted yeah. by the Tennessee Titans. I'm like, oh, the worst possible scenario, <laughs> right? Man. So guess what? I call them to do that 300 uh, signs, 700. But now play. they're like, no, yeah, see you later. Fuck I'm interested. you. Go yeah. fuck yourself. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Damn. No crickets. I don't get any calls. And at this point, Chris starts blowing up my phone. Like, hey, what are they saying? What are they saying? And I'm, I'm saying, ah, that, nah, they're thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so I would Meanwhile, call this. Meanwhile, sweating yeah, bullets. Yeah, Who the fuck I would, cross some eyes and tease. I would that, call yeah. this a bad situation, right? It's yeah. a shitty situation. Yeah. And so at, luckily at the time, I, uh, so remember I said I had Rasheed Davis, who was with the Chicago Bears. That G at the time was uh, uh, had built I built a friendship with uh, and he was helping he was, he was guiding me as to what to do and in fact every once in a while he'd, he'd help me as to you know perhaps they were looking at this young kid over here at this no name college you might want to take a look at that so, so you develop relationships and business relationships throughout the league that's how that's how it goes and so I call I'm, I I start drinking I'm not gonna lie I was like I was I was like dude I'm gonna lose Chris Brown I'm gonna lose my opportunity yeah. to like show that I know what I'm doing mm -hmm. and so uh, I call him and I go look uh, this sucks. I, I don't know what to do. He's like, what's your problem? I'm like, well, the Titans don't want Chris. Nobody wants Chris. He's like, oh, he's like, what? Does he, he needs to go? I'm like, no, he, they're, they're, they, he doesn't. They don't want. They don't want him anymore. And he's like, okay, all right. Well, give me a call in a week if you don't get hear anything. And at the time, thank God, uh, within that week, Lindell White came to camp and he was like three bills. He was fat. Oh shit. He was oh. fat and he wasn't be able. He can't. He couldn't pick up the offense. Couldn't pick up the blocks. And so I get a call from the Titans going, hey, we'll do that deal. Oh. oh. And so I take it briefly. I call Chris. Like, hey, they're going to do that 300, you know. Fuck that. <laughs> he still doesn't want it. Yeah. Fuck oh, that. No. I'm like, oh, my God. So uh, now I'm on my, you know, fifth martini of the day. <laughs> and I call I call the GM uh, over there with my friend. And I go, they don't want He's like, he's got to do that deal. I'm like, what does he want? And I'm like, he wants more money. He's like, okay. He's like, I don't, I don't really like the Titans either. I'm like, okay. He's like, all right, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to do this for you, but you owe me. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Please tell me. Like, do tell. <laughs> yeah. So he's like, here's what you're going to do. I'll give you permission to speak with the media. Okay. I don't know who you know, but you're going to have to find someone. And I will give you permission to let me know that we're interested in Chris. And we're going to visit Chris. Oh, that's going to get his value. Mm. To look and, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to call over there because I hate that that MF over there <laughs> and I'm just going to kick under the tires. I'm just going to see how he is, how he is as a person. And it's like, and it's like, when you never know, like maybe I'll change my mind. I'm not sure, but I'll tell you what, 
my mind's gonna be made Sunday night. It's Thursday. Good luck. <laughs> so so <laughs> I call Chris and go, hey, here's the deal. Like, you know, they say they're gonna visit you. It's not real. I'm gonna I'm gonna speak to some people in the media. I'm not necessarily sure it's real, but just know that this is the only shot that I can do to, to try to pick up, pick up this contract, and move the money. And so, uh, my friend calls over there. I call Tennessee. What do they want? They go literally like, okay, when, what do they want? What, I mean, what are they going to offer? 2 million, 2 million. Like, come on. I'm like, yeah, well, I mean, Chris wants to be in Tennessee, but yeah, I mean, look, it's a good system over there. And, uh, I mean, yeah, at least two, like that's, that's fair. One year, two, not one year, one. And, and sure enough, uh, in the meantime, I get a call from, from Chris going, dude, Chicago's interested in me. It's on ESPN. <laughs> I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? I told you that I was going to do that. But the media is so powerful. Media is so powerful uh, that literally like, that he thinks. So I had to remind him like, dude, no. <laughs> no, that no, wasn't no, real. <laughs> no, and let's do this deal. By the way, the Titans just raised the deal almost a million. It was one point eight five or something like that. We ended up settling on. But so there's an example. Then we got the deal done. So yeah. there's an example uh, of me cool. making a difference. Yeah, it's like yeah, walking yeah. into a bar with your attractive female friends. It's so that other women think that you're, you know, more attractive. <laughs> yeah. I've never had to do that. I don't know if <laughs> yes, it's, it's a common strategy. It's for a some common. Over it's, a common <laughs> it's a very, very common strategy. Now, I, I would think too. You, uh, what is the, uh, what is the probably the the scariest moment for you as an agent? Where because I would think hanging out, and I've been with you plenty of times, hanging out with athletes. <sighs> What has been the scariest moment for you where you may have lost everything you've built for yourself because you're fucking hanging out with these guys? Because I know you've probably been real close a few times. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say, uh, uh, fuck. Uh, do you guys remember uh, Pablo Sandoval and the whole Santa Cruz issue? Like the, I don't know if you guys remember this, but here's how it went. And it, uh, I'll speak to this and hopefully uh, hopefully it'll work out. But so uh, Pablo injures his, injures his hamate, breaks his hamate bone, which is a very common injury in baseball players because it's the bottom of the bat. You just break that thing off. So he was rehabbing and, and he was doing a great job. And so right before he got back on to, to uh, you know, his rehab and I forget in Fresno or something like that, we came back to, we kind of celebrated that he's healthy again. Then this was on there, by the way, this was a even year. Uh, so it was a world series. It was the year he won the world series MVP, but this is prior. Um, and so, and so we decided that my, my mom had a great little spot at Seascape up in, uh, up in Aptos, right? A little yeah. beach house. So I'm like, man, let's just hang out and have fun. Cause after this, you're, you're back on the, you know, you're back on the grind. So cool. So, um, I actually, I let my mom, Hey mom, we're going to, you know, go up there and, and hang out. And he's like, cool, you know, enjoy it. We go there and let's just say, uh, shit went down. There was, you know, there was some partying. And one thing led to another and not to get into too many details, but yeah, that's real vague. Yeah. 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 Let's, let's just say, let, let's let just me start. imagine what kind of party are we imagining yeah. right here? We imagine like a birthday party for a bunch of 13 yeah. year olds. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, uh, no, it was, we were getting down like Charlie Brown. Yeah. You know? Um, and, and that's fine. That's okay. That's okay. And so the, the next day it's, it's eight in the morning. And what I would do, and and I don't care because we don't have that place anymore. So I'll tell you guys. I mean, what I would do because it was kind of like a hotel. It's a hotel condo, so you can literally order room service. It's it was awesome. It was awesome. you order room service, but you own it, right? Mm -hmm. So what I would do instead of doing the dishes, I would take a garbage bag and I would just throw the dishes, throw whatever robe, whatever, just throw it and just throw it in the trash because they'd be reset. <laughs> so I'm hungover. It's, it's eight hack. in the morning. I want to make sure that Pablo gets to to practice and all that shit. So I'm with this garbage bag, and there's like it's like a robe and dishes and clothes, like just towels. And I <laughs> evidence I, basically. Well, think about the, think about the optics basically of this what you shit. Said, that was a nice way of saying that. Like that. basically all the evidence yeah. Yeah. got in the trash bag. All so, DNA, everything accounted dude, for. I fuck. I walk out. I walk out, and two. Guys, like, like, not in, not in a uniform. Just two dudes. Like, are, are you, are, you, uh, are you forty four? You know, is, are you? I'm like, yeah, yeah. He's like, what is that? I'm like, it's just, it's just trash. I'm gonna throw trash away. Like, uh, and here's the rules on, you know, once you throw something in the garbage, it's, it's no longer yours, right? Yeah. So, you know, they can take a look. Well, they, they took a look. And there was robes, there was towels. Like, is, is uh, did anything go on over here? We'd <laughs> so like to talk died? to you. Yeah, I'm like, what are you talking about? You like talk to you? Well, Pablo is Pablo Sandoval in there? I'm like, yeah. Like, what, what's the problem? He's like, look, no big deal. I'm Officer So and So. Oh, yeah, I'm Officer So and So. We just like you to come down to the. We just want you to come down to to Santa Cruz and the police department. We just want to have a quick conversation. Not, no one's in trouble. 
Nothing's going is on. Is it like a dead hooker? Like, how, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I haven't had that problem yet. But, um, so I'm, I'm, my heart's starting to skip. And now, like, yeah, the optics of me having, you know, now in hindsight, it's like, oh, f- like, fuck, right? Yeah. And so I come back in. I'm like, Pablo, I, I think his brother's there too. I, I can't remember. It's like, dude, did anything like happen that was like not okay last night? Everything cool? No, I'm not. No, I'm, we're good. We're good. I'm like, all right, well, uh, apparently we're not because there's two police officers out here. Now they're asking us to come down to the police station and, and we should probably go. Like, we'll probably go and I'll have time to figure this out. So I'm driving. I am freaking out. I'm texting at the time. He's a judge now, but at the time, one of the top uh, criminal defense attorneys around. Um, and I'm texting 911, like, call me. Well, this dude, this attorney, he's in a murder trial. He's in a murder trial uh, defending this guy. He looks at his phone and goes, you know, judge, you know, give me a second. I say, when what's going on? Like I, I'm in the middle of a murder trial. I'm like, dude, this is what's going on. We're traveling I'm with Pablo Sandoval. We're traveling to the police station. I don't know the fuck's going on, but you need to get here. He's like, okay. He goes back, goes to the judge. Judge, I'm I'm sorry. You, you're a Giants fan. He goes, yeah. He goes, <laughs> I don't know exactly what's going on, but my friend never does this, and he needs me right now. So he he calls his, you know, puts a pause on the uh, on the murder trial and shoots up there and goes, dude, do not say a fucking word, right? So we go to we go to the police station, and uh, we start right there. And I go, you know what? And he, he's like, dude, just say say you got to go. Say you'll do it tomorrow. So we go there. And uh, the police, the police are down there and I go, you know what? Pablo has to get to practice. Um, We're not being arrested. And so why don't we just do this tomorrow? You know, if there's an issue, like we can handle it. And the dude goes, he goes, he looks at me. He's like, well, you're fine. He's like, but if he leaves, we do have to arrest him and we're being cool with you right now. So either you come in and talk with us or we'll arrest him right now, which is not going to be good for anybody. Oh, wow. No. So go, oh, fuck. So at this point, my, my heart is, by the way, I'm hungover. I, I probably had like two hours sleep. <laughs> my mouth is dry. I'm, I'm like, uh, what are we doing? So I'm like, okay, well, let's go. So I'm, as we're walking up, I'm telling Pablo, like, do not say a word. I don't know what happened. And you, you know, whatever happened, uh, just don't say anything. And so my career is flashing in between my, you know. Yeah, 100%. By, uh, by 11 o'clock, it was 8 a.m. By 11 o'clock, we're three hours there. The attorney hadn't got there yet. I, you know, now it's, you know, my partner is going, Hey, Sabian's blown up my phone. Where the fuck is Pablo? And now the media is like, what, the, you know, what starting to like, what's going on? I forget what, there's always like this one, there's always one media person that is like, I don't know if they're like part of the CIA. <laughs> I don't know how it works, but they there's always it. one. Yeah. yeah. And sure enough, there was one person from, I think it was from the Merck, probably the Merck, uh, that, that, that had, a, had a beat on this thing, that something was going on. They didn't know what was going on, but something was going on. So finally, we, we were, my attorney, the attorney comes and, and they, he goes, look, you know, Pablo, did anything happen that was not okay? It's okay. Like you need to tell us. And mind you, Pablo was going, everything, you know, I didn't do anything. I didn't, I didn't do anything. And finally I was like, Pablo, it's okay if you, you know, did something, but we need to know right now yeah. if something happened. Yeah. You know, he goes, eh, maybe. I go, <laughs> fuck. <laughs> fuck. So, so at that point, it's like, look, no, mind it. I don't know. Like uh, Pablo, uh, ostensibly, you know, this uh, traditionally, there's a lot of money grabs out there with athletes. So regardless of what, what happened, you know, at the end of the day, um, I, there's not a, there's not a, there's not a bad bone in Pablo's body. I mean, he's a fun loving, happy guy, but in the context of what was going on, this ain't good. This ain't good. And so what we agreed to that day was I am the one that got interrogated and Pablo got interrogated a little bit. And then a whole investigation went through and he got, he got cleared. Um, uh, but that, that was a, that was a really, really, really tough situation. The tougher situation is by four o'clock I was done and we had to actually, we had to sneak Pablo out the back the back door, go in a different car, get him going because there was a couple media out there. Well, that night, I'm, I go to visit my mom, and she goes, how's Santa Cruz? How, how is Seascape? And literally, the news is flashing that Pablo Sandoval gets accused of sexual assault. Is on the TV. I jump in front of the TV going, oh, everything was great. Everything was cool. <laughs> I guess she knows really you were good. with him, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so not only was I like, you know, saw my career flashing in front of my eyes, I also see my, you know, I don't want my mom out of me. I mean, I could, you can do anything. You get your mom out of you, that ain't good. Yeah, that's, that's not good. <laughs> how, 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 like, how big of a percentage of your job would you say is managing that kind of shit versus 90. signing? 
right. ninety. Well, think about it. Well, how, how many? How often does it? How often does a contract come up, man? I mean, yeah, in the NFL, yeah. you got four years till you do your first, your your second real deal. Right? So the rest of the time, you're just like, okay, you're yeah. managing, you're managing, uh, and and that, yeah, and it's it's like I said, NFL L's, you know, because it, uh, the stories. Well, talk on. to me a little bit about you know one of the I think if I recall one of the reasons why you were introducing me to Marquette King back then yeah. was. I had already started building a social media presence. I obviously am not a professional athlete or famous by any means, but yet I was starting to create this this brand around my Instagram. Yeah. And I think I remember you trying to get him to like put pieces together. Yeah. Like yeah. you need to be thinking about this. How much of your job now is kind of switched into that and helping these guys with their yeah. social media and stuff? You know, it, it's it's interesting with Marquette. Uh, you know, Marquette is a really really talented individual. I mean, he's talented athletically and musically. He's not skilled yet, but he's extremely talented, right? I mean, he is. He, <laughs> yeah, he's, no, no. he's special. But I think Marquette really was, was a pioneer in this stuff uh, for me because literally we would spend, we would spend, I, I remember spending an hour and a half on designing one fucking tweet that he would put. We would argue back and forth as to how to present it, what to talk about, wow. how to do it. He would, but he would be meticulous about this and be mm. on the phone with me for literally an hour discussing how exactly he should tweet this. And it would be little things like this that we, we'd have a, we'd have a, a, maybe a smart comment or something that interesting politically, but he'd go, oh, that's not, that's not, that's too smart. It's too, people won't get it. People won't get it. And so we would, we would literally, we'd dumb it down. We, yeah. we'd, and we'd have this, there was this process. Um, and so I would say, yeah, I would say 70, 70% or a, a majority of my time is, uh, is uh, dedicated towards understanding and branding, which is part of it, branding yeah. the athlete effectively. Now, how many drunken tweets have you saved? <laughs> Have I saved? Yeah, like if somebody had posted, oh, was about to like, post something, you know, and then funny. they screen it through there, you. There's companies out there that approach me all the time, going, "Hey, we have this software where any athlete tweet goes. Got to go through first. you first. Huh? Yes, and there's that has no, to be a thing. Yeah, and there's no. That's like asking, uh, you know, Marquette to put parental controls on his on his, uh, you know, on his video or something. Like he's not going to do that. No athlete is going to. do They're going to say fuck off. Now, how yeah. big of an issue is it with these athletes where you have these these fans or these you know these female fans who want to trap them or get them caught in a bad situation so that they can capitalize like is that something that you have to really watch out for oh absolutely a absolutely um and and depending on the you know it's funny uh women in general the, the concept of groupies i mean it's it's real and, and let me tell you how deep this goes there there are what i consider what i label as professional groupies and how i define a professional groupie is this <clears throat> not only do they understand where the money is whether it's you know mlb nba nfl which is usually how it goes, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's usually golf, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they know, they, they don't, they not only know what sport has the most money, they can tell you who starts, who doesn't start, who's in a contract year, who isn't in a contract year. Oh, wow, there is an entire groupie culture that exists that oh, target wow. these guys. Mm. So yeah, it's, it's serious. And how do they play the game? How do they try and trap these guys? What's the, what's the deal? Well, how, how does any woman trap, uh, trap any man? I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I think that no, literally. I mean, it's it's, it's well, I would it's think it's glamour. I, I would imagine if it's got a cult like following like that, and they're almost organized and that smart about it. They're even smart about their tactics, and I think that's what Sal's alluding to. Like, yeah, like how do you even get close to a guy? I mean, he's oh, obviously yeah. so many people are around him. Like, yeah, how do you right. get his attention? How do they get it's, close to him sure, in the first place? Sure. So, I mean, it's. It's it's the looks. It's Instagram. It's the looks. I mean, there's agents. I don't employ this tactic, but there's agents out there, for example, that hire hot chicks to go into these guys, these collegiate guys' Instagram. Go, hey, what's up? Oh, and um, try and wow. sabotage them, and then so they could get back. Yeah, to sabotage or get their attention. Yeah, it's hey, what's up? You you know, I'm from I'm from I'm from Michigan. You're from Michigan. Yeah. What's up? Hey, by the way, boom, boom, boom. Yeah. I mean, so it's the same thing. Uh, social media is a mm. platform for a lot of things. A lot of things, and and this this direct messaging is it's opportunity for growth in business in every possible sector you can imagine, including <laughs> the groupie sector. <laughs> wow, and I I mean it's got to be scary. Um, I mean I'm a 41 year old man. I understand how this works, but you got these are a lot of these guys are kids. Yeah, 20 something years old. All of a sudden they get all this money and attention. You're getting all these girls contact. It's like I mean, uh, what kind of conversations are you having with them? You're trying to educate them, like, hey man, here's the deal. You got to be careful, dude. It, you, yes, you, you educate you educate as much as you can, but it's it's kind of like um, 
people ask about, you know, athletes and money. I just was, uh, was talking with somebody about, but that context and the NFL and the NFLP have done a great job trying to educate, but that's more recent, to, right? But yeah, but you have to still, the, my point is you have to be ready to listen. Mm. And at two years point at, at 21, 22, they're not listening to a lot. They're, they're driven by, by other tendencies. Right. And well, so they're not, they're not trying to listen. Well, Marquette's an example of that, right? I mean, I, after I posted that, I actually had a bunch of people uh, dropping in my DMs going like, I don't know why the Raiders got rid of them. Why did yeah. the Broncos get rid of them? And then you had that conversation yeah. with me. Yeah. So we, what happened at the first, what happened to the Raiders? Cause he was doing great for them. Yeah. What yeah. happened? So, um, there was a change of a regime. So the Reggie McKenzie was the GM who was, it was, a, it was a, I thought a great GM. I, I thought the former coach was a good coach, but for whatever reason, Mark, uh, the owner of the team decided that he wanted to change regimes. Mm -hmm. Right. And so in comes, in comes Gruden, in comes John Gruden. And, and John Gruden was, was ready to take things back old school. He want all, you know, he wants, he wanted soldiers. He wanted people that would listen to him and go his way or the highway. Um, and so what he did is he researched and, and obviously Marquette and, and the concept of what Gruden wanted as a, as a elite connected group was completely different. Marquette, uh, kind of symbolizes creativity and, and, uh, disruption. Right. And, and as a coach, you don't necessarily, if you're a old school coach, you do not want those elements on, on a team. And so he was already kind of on traveling a little bit on, on thin ice. Um, not only because he was a little disruptive, but even, I mean, look, he was getting penalties on the field for dancing. Right. Mm. And so as a coach, it, it's not necessarily that he was getting, that he was dancing on the field. It was getting penalties mm -hmm. for dancing. So he saw that as a potential liability. Number right. one, number two, what happened is he, you know, Gruden did his research. He has a long history with the Oakland Raiders. And, and, and as all of you know, the NFL is quite a good old boys network, right? Mm -hmm. There, there's not a lot there. It's a, it's a, it's a very tight knit, uh, ecosystem. And so I think, you know, at, at first glance, especially when I was a true advocate for Marquette, it was like, you know, I was really concerned, but what he did is he did his research and he spoke to not only coaches that were already there or certain people that were going to stay, remain in the organization and asked about Marquette, but he went all the way down to the little people. And I think one of the issues that, that Marquette has, he wasn't, he didn't always treat everyone, uh, nicely. Mm. He had, he has, you know, had a little bit of a, uh, of an asshole component to him. Uh, not unlike, you know, Barry Bonds in a sense, like, mm. you know, if you had too many cleats in your bag, you know, he was going to yell at the equipment manager. Mm. Uh, if, if, if your balls were, you know, if they had some new balls, they're brushing, uh, getting ready for him to kick. He didn't like those balls. He'd kick it over the fence. And I think what happened was coach Gruden spoke to those people as well mm. and came up with the new opinion that, Hey, you know what? I'm not, nice I'm not dealing with this. We want. Yeah. I'm not dealing with this. And, and I'm not trying stuff. to throw, mind you, I'm not trying to throw shade on Marquette completely. Everybody has their other thing, but from Gruden's perspective, based on his research, that's why he made that decision. Well, it's mm. an employee, isn't it? So he sends him over yeah. to Denver. Yeah. Okay. Well, he doesn't send him. Right. Let me talk about that. Gruden's old that school sucks. too. Because I didn't think, look, Marquette, the day he got released, so the special teams coach was this Italian dude, and then he's got he's got Gruden who has a um, you know propensity to be seen as angry, right? So the day that he's supposed to report, um, and because he's a new coach, a new coach he can uh, report. Uh, the players have to report two weeks earlier when you have a new coach. So he reports to um, OTAs, and he has Limicello for the uh, for the new t Italian special teams coach, yeah, good deal. and he grabbed a box of Snickers for Gruden in the event that he gets hangry. <laughs> <laughs> so this shows the personality of Marquette, right? I mean, he's, he's a fun loving, good dude for the most part. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so he goes up and it's like, Hey guys. And, and Mackenzie goes, Hey, come, come here. He's like, uh, you're not, we're going to let you go. I'll let you go today. That's how they told him. Yeah. Wow. And, and I didn't, I, I didn't think he was going to be let. He had a, a, he had a awesome great year. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He had a great year. And so I get this call. It's Marquette. Like, hey, Raiders are letting me go. And I'm like, what? And I'm, by the way, I think I'm in LA at the time. I was, I mean, I knew, and there was a time when you can, like May and April, you, uh, May you can relax, especially after the draft. But the problem was I wasn't prepared for Marquette to get released. Like I just, it didn't, I didn't cross my mind. And everybody had kind of uh, done their, doing their due diligence on punters. And so you, you can't release him at a time when he was being released. It's not a good time for a player to get released. So they kind of screwed him. Like at least if they were released him in free agency in March or February or March, then I could have got him on another team. Oh, wow. All of a sudden, I'm like, oh, man, here's another 
bad situation, right? right? Mm-hmm. Here's a bad situation. And so, and man, those were some tough days for Marquette. I mean, because he was, he was depressed. I was depressed. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Because look, I called, I called the Vikings. No, we're not interested. Uh, Philly, maybe, but it would be a minimum deal. So like maybe 800, he was scheduled to make, I think three and a half that year. Oh, wow. So it's like, dude, <laughs> and, and, and Philly. And then New York was like, yeah, we're interested. And Marquette's like, fuck that. I'm not going to fucking New York. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's because it's 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 because of the weather. And as a punter, you don't you don't necessarily be in New York. And yeah. so I sat there. I'm like, dude, I, you have to go to either Philly or New York. That's the only people that are off the minimum deal. He goes, no. And uh, I had a friend of mine who's, who's a business advisor of mine. He goes, hey, call Denver, call Denver. I'm like, I'm like, I don't know, man. They're not calling me. I never as an agent, you're not supposed to blank. You know, you're not really supposed to blank. But he's not call Denver. So I called. I called Denver. And uh, I was like, look, you know, we have an interesting situation here. You guys have a rival. You have this guy's a weapon. Can you imagine him in Denver? And Elway started thinking about it. Going, ah, Can you imagine Marquette King in Denver? That'd be pretty good. And so I, we lucked out. I, I, uh, we did a deal that you know, I think it was like three for seven or eight, which was great at that time at the, at, for the circumstance when the only other offer on the table was eight hundred one year for 800. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Put him in a great situation. Um, dude, that's like the punter's mecca, kicker or punter mecca. You want to be oh, yeah. the ball flies, yeah. dude. <laughs> yeah. So I think that we have a huge win here, right? Yeah. No, no. He it was the most unhappy, horrible year for Marquette, mm-hmm. um, predominantly because he just didn't get along with the special teams coach, mm-hmm. and they disagreed. And, How, and what do you disagree on in punting? Well, <laughs> this is it's only a couple <laughs> things you do. Yeah. So get in between those poles. Yeah. So yeah, so please. from Marquette's perspective, this is from a you know from a specialist right. professional punter's perspective. Number one, he had him kicking awkwardly. He he wanted him to kick like a forty five degree trick kick. Oh, he was trying to change. The so way he kick. was trying to change the way he kicked. So that in that would piss me off too in his defense, yeah. right? Mm. And quite frankly, that's what ended up he got he ended up getting hurt, and he attributes it to the coach attempting to change his kicking style, mm. which may or may not be the case. But the fact is that mm. he did get hurt and and that was true. And to his defense for the first couple weeks of, uh, he approached things the right way. When he complained to me every fucking day that he hated Denver. And I was like, why? Because I don't get along with the special team. So I'm like, look, just call a meeting with your coach and the head coach. So he did, he did the meet. Hey guys, like I just want to punt the way I punt. Like, I don't like this way. They said fine, and then the next day the coach is being a dick again, right? Mm. And so, if the coach said punt fifty yards, Marquette would punt seventy yards. If the coach <laughs> said punt thirty yards, Marquette would punch five yards. Ugh, pure disruption, and we and and his unhappiness. He was also, by the way, healing from the. He had just got a Raiders tattoo, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh no! Just got a Raiders tattoo. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so you can imagine, like he's all he's a human being. He was hurt, like he yeah, was. He sure. was. He was thrown. Well, yeah, you have a top five season, you know. It doesn't make any yeah. sense to you. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to you. Like, in hindsight, sure, oh, what could I have done better, all that. But overall, like I said, he's a genuine good human being. And he felt really sideswiped. He loved the Raiders. He still loves the Raiders, right? Mm. And so so psychologically, he was dealing with, with grief. And he didn't know how to express himself more. Uh, the only way, to, it came out through rebellion. So he gets in fights with the coach. And then, mm. Elway, I get a call. Uh can you tell Marquette to get off his fucking skateboard? Because on social, going back to social media, he was rebelling through two things. Uh, he was um, actually healing from uh, embracing music. So he would, all he would do in Denver is go to the recording studio and try to work on his new craft, right? Yeah. And the number two is he'd skateboard to piss the team off. Hmm. <laughs> and, and they're so, like, that's a liability. So well, they're not, not only liability, they just made a $7 million fucking investment. They right. don't want to see the punter break his, like, do it in the off season if you have to do <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. No, what exactly. are you doing it's at a fucking skating right park in Colorado Play ping pong, in right? Do something right. else. Yeah, right, you right, don't right. do that. So so lessons learned by Marquette King and why he is in the XFL. Number one, if the coach says punt 50 yards, you punt 50 yards. Yeah. If if uh, Elway is pissed off that you're on a skateboard, throw away the fucking skateboard. Yeah. <laughs> And, and so that's that's why I think he and he's matured. I, I think he's learned a lot. Now, did this did well, this uh, break up your guys's oh, yeah, uh, because, relationship? Well, and sure. Then- he gets he gets cut. Um, I, I I work with him, and and he's thinking you know the next season, uh, the next free agent year, someone will just pick him up. Now, how, wait, back up though. How how does he get cut uh, with a contract like that? Sure. So. So uh, you you can release injured. So you can have an injury. You can have an injury settlement agreement, 
And so okay. um, they, so he, they just wanted him out of there. Okay. They wanted him out. And, and this is how it worked, actually. They didn't have they, – they could have made him stay there. They could have made him stay there and rehab in Denver. Well, that's the last – fucking place that Marquette wanted to hang out was was a with a team he didn't at the time a coaches he didn't get along with yeah and a place he didn't like right you know and so that that's how and it, string his money along yeah. versus just yeah. cash him out and like like, cash him out and let him go now do they does that public uh, public do you do you know how much they cashed him out for that do they well you so so the way it works in the NFL is um you have a one time if you're an NFL vet uh and you make the first week of the roster mm-hmm. uh your money for that year is guaranteed Mm. Oh, okay. So it, it so we we just exercised that that um, injury guarantee option. Oh, okay. Oh, Got very interesting. And now then, I know one person that hasn't made the XFL, and that is Colin Kaepernick. Oh, do you have like I know that there's other <laughs> agents out there, and I like you must have like a communication between other agents and yeah. you know information about how things transpired. Yeah. Is there any like insights in terms of like how he, you know his relationship to the NFL, XFL, all that uh, kind of stuff? Dude, are we going down there? Yes, dude. I, I, I want for to. sure. It's probably one I of the hottest topics. Okay. Is, yeah. All right. So so let me so let me preface it with this. Let me preface it with this. I, I'm just gonna keep it real and my I'm gonna share my perspective on this thing. Yeah. But I will say, um, at the end of the day, what Kaepernick has come to symbolize is something totally different than what transpired and what the purpose was originally. Oh, really? Interesting. Okay. I, and that's what I hold a lot of belief. So um, one of the reasons this is such a hot topic, like race is, race is electric, right? And there's yeah. a lot of issues that we, we do with race. And sure. and for Colin to ultimately embrace the role, great. Now, how it fucking started is is what kind of pisses me off because this is my perspective because I had a couple guys on, on the team of that that year, the Niners. So here's here's my perspective. Kaepernick is it, – it's clear, number one, that he may not be the elite thrower that people thought he was. One of the main reasons why he did so well that, that first year when he was balling, um, I think they – what did they lose to Baltimore in that, yeah. that Super Bowl? Mm-hmm. One of the reasons is people uh, – coaches didn't know what to key on. And so, for example, as a, as a quarterback, if you can't throw, you'll put nine in the box and, and cover the run, right? Mm-hmm. But with Kaepernick, because he was such a, a good athlete, he, he could run. I mean, he's, he's a 4-5 or five guy. Um, they didn't know what to do, and that's what confused them. They didn't know if they could fix it on the run or fix it on the pass. Right. Yeah. So once they, once they reviewed the tape and realized that he really didn't read defenses uh, and he keyed on maybe one guy, mm-hmm. that's when his— They figured him out. Yeah, that's and that's what happens. Look, uh, with a lot of guys, uh, what what will tend to happen is they'll key off tendencies, and if you're a good enough and elite enough and uh, athlete— you work on whatever they're king on and fix that mm-hmm. and make and be, and make yourself even better. Right. Sure. An example, Michael Vick, right? Michael Vick came out, they weren't ready for him. He fucking yeah. destroyed yeah. the first year. It was a whole new thing. Defenses started to key on it, spy him more, and then it changed, but then he still elevated as a as and, a, and and to, to your point, so Crabtree used to be the benefit of 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 Kaepernick. That's the only person he'd key on. Mm-hmm. Back there, that's a perfect example of Vick. Back in the day, it was Algy Crumpler. Algy Crumpler, I, don't know if I remember the tight end. His tight end would mm-hmm. ball. Mm-hmm. It's because he would only key off Algy Crumpler. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so once you realize that, they started shutting him down. And 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 let's just say that look, Cap didn't always have the best rep, uh, relationship with the receivers and all that because of this scenario. He didn't. He wasn't throwing accurately, mm-hmm. right? So there was disruption. And then and then that that coach comes in. Kaepernick is not doing well. And so he gets he gets benched. He gets benched as the starter, and Blaine for Blaine Gabbert. Like, come on, like, <laughs> yeah. like, come on, like, uh, look, Blaine. Sure, he's a great guy, not an elite quarterback, right? But now he gets benched. Okay, so now the first game he sits on the bench, right? And then the second game is like kind of when he starts when he does this kneeling. Okay, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so look, understanding all that context. Now you make the decision as to what really transpired. Right. Am I a disgruntled fucking player who is crying because I'm fucking sitting on the bench or am I really about this movement? Yeah. And find a different purpose or whatever. Right. Or a yeah. Different way to, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so that's what I personally, uh, I'm not saying it, it's this or that. I think it's this and that with this being more uh, disgruntled player. Right? right. And, and to the point, you know, uh, I think that you know Trump. Trump has a whole thing against the NFL. I mean, shit, he won. He won an antitrust uh, suit for one dollar uh, against the NFL. He hates, you know. So he's got he's got personal shit with the NFL. But I think what's brilliant with Trump is that he he took advantage of of what happened. But we will, I don't want to get too off point. The point is, he's disgruntled and then he kneels. And and I don't think he necessarily even knew at that moment 
exactly what he was kneeling for. I think, and in context, I think that you know his girlfriend at the time was, was kind of a, a social rights activist, right? And I think there was discussion and dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, and I think personally, that was more driven. It was never about. Um, you know, against America or anything like that. I think that was bullshit. That was that was lost in translation. Oh yeah, both sides played it to their. Yeah. Oh, he's against the troops. Oh yeah, no, they're not against the. Yeah, no, that's yeah. fucked up. And the true story behind that, and and this is a little bit of irony, is I believe I was told that he actually spoke with an army ranger about. Um, Doing he actually it. was concerned. Yeah, I, he was I concerned. heard that too. I heard that he talked. He talked to it before he did I think it. He talked and talked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He, <laughs> he talked to things. a ranger before, and they said no. If yeah, because because the ranger, what the ranger said was actually. Um, if if one of our men get taken down, the family kneels during the the funeral, or something like that. Right. So mm -hmm. where so he's like and that's also what they fight for. They 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 you know our military fights to preserve 100%. our our liberty to be able to to do shit like that. Yeah. And so, so that actually is, it, that's not against the soldiers. It's actually it's hey for. that's what we fight for. Yeah. And so so to his credit, I think look uh, from Cap's perspective, he did his due diligence and he spoke with someone in the ar you know in the armed forces. And from his perspective, this was not a fuck you to the flag. It was actually an issue of respect. Mm -hmm. And so he kneeled out of respect saying, look, there's a problem. Now, personally, I think he was more, he was more cons driven towards police brutality and, and, and race racism there yeah. than, than any sort of true statement against the United States of America. But as you said, I mean, this was taken advantage of politically and Trump with his, with his uh, skeletons and claws against the NFL really, really took a, really took some heat. And then if you, if you heard of a, uh, what is it? A victim, uh, a victor of circumstance mm. or a victim of circumstance. Mm. There's a victim. Well, I call Cap a victor of circumstance, mm -hmm. right? Because what happened was nothing that he could predict. What happened is it did start an entire nation's dialogue into racial issues in the United States and the first amendment, all that stuff, right? It took and ran. I don't believe Kaepernick ever uh, would have predicted that it came to be what it is now, today. Now, from your perspective, at this point, he's being benched. They, yeah. they figured him out. So his nickname was Mr. Achilles, actually, for the uh, receivers. But. Okay, so <laughs> his, his career maybe not looking so good. He does that stunt, yeah. blows up, yeah. signs a huge deal with Nike. Do you yeah. think he made more money doing that, or do you think he lost money? Because, of course, mm. now he's having issues with getting signed or whatever. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was a smart move business-wise, considering Ooh. he's got the big deal with Nike, or do you think it was a bad mm. move? That's a great question uh, on a number of different levels. Number one, I don't believe playing in the NFL is necessarily healthy for you. Um, and as a quarterback... That's smart, dude, yeah, sure. Look, uh, there's a lot of players, like, uh, those hits will change you. Like, yeah. those hits... Those hits will change you, and 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 every year, if you've ever played football, and for me, I can only speak to to my collegiate days, which I was known much more for keeping the team GPA uh, high, than, <laughs> All right. making plays on the field, academic but, ringer. Yeah, it's but I will tell you, I will tell you that every year, in the beginning of camp. You, you get that one hit where your soul is shaken and you decide whether you're going to play that year. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so so in that sense, you know, interesting career move. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not sure that he left a lot of money on the tip. I just don't know. I'd have to research and see what exactly the deal with Nike Again, but uh, quite frankly, uh, he isn't. He wasn't being myopic because look what he's look what he's positioned himself as now, or, or look what's how he's been positioned. He's he's taken advantage of, and I don't mean that uh, negatively, but he's embraced. Like I said before, he's embraced a role as a symbol for uh, for racial discontent. Yeah, well, I mean, I was going to say theoretically, football dangerous. I'm getting benched. To I'm going to protest. I'm going to be this symbol. I all I have to do is talk about yeah. particular getting signed by Nike. Nike makes a shit ton of money yep. off this whole deal. It's almost you could almost look at it and be like, that was a smart move. A move. Maybe he didn't realize it, but it turned out a hundred percent right now. At the time, he's also having trouble getting signed and all that stuff. But maybe it doesn't make that big of a difference because that's, I think he's still point. making a ton of money. That that's a really good point. Yeah, right? but he's right? he's got to be good enough. To at least play in the XFL, and they're not even. That's looking. where I'm confused. It's all the controversy, dude. Because think of all the shit that's coming along with him. Well, he's right? probably asking for too much money. That's kind of what I heard. Well, uh, so to your point, so number one, he sees himself as a starter, 
Mm-hmm. That was the whole issue with the Niners. That was the issue with the other teams at the at first. Oh, a lot of people. I have friends that are like, "He, this is such bullshit. He would have been a starter on no. any other team." No, absolutely. I, I don't. I don't believe it. And and I don't believe it based on his mechanics and and how he throws. Well, like, <laughs> not only not only that. You have, yeah, you have firsthand experience. You, you're representing the guys yeah. that are catching the ball from yeah. him. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. And yeah. what'd you say his nickname was? Mr. Achilles. Mr. Achilles. Yeah. Mr. Achilles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. Now, do do players ever negotiate deals? with Without agents, mm. uh, and is, is that a problem? Is that an issue? Richard Sherman does that, right? Yeah, yeah. So that, so I can speak to that. Uh, Richard, so someone in Richard Sherman's position, Dante Culpepper, I think, was a, kind of the first uh, player to kind of promote the fact that he was doing his own deals. If you are an elite uh, athlete and you're a free agent deal, and if you're an elite in your position and you've had a good year, what have you done for me lately? You had a good year. Mm-hmm. There's really not a lot of rocket science to doing your deal. Sure. Because what you're doing, you're measuring statistics and you're taking a look at the top five players receiving that type of money in your position and saying, I want the more, I want the most, or I'm, I'm top five, top Easy. 10. Easy mm-hmm. shit. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that context, uh, speaking to Richard Sherman, I think it makes sense. Like he doesn't have to really, it's, it's that easy, isn't it? He could just compare himself to all his yeah, peers. Yeah. And- for the most part, if you're, again, if you're in that situation where you people want you and you've had a good season and there's not a lot to it, there's not a lot to it, but not having an agent, I always go to make sure you define what that means. What does an agent mean for you? If it's no contract advisor, I don't need a lot of people to advise me on my contract then that's one thing. If it's, I don't need an agent, then tell me what the fuck an agent does. Because from my perspective, I do a lot and I take pride in making sure I put that person, that athlete in the best position to succeed, both socially, financially, physically, mentally, all that. What um, a great way to articulate. You get fucked up with them all the time and you just make sure they don't get in trouble. That's what that is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. That's 90% of your job. You already and, said and that. as we know, that doesn't always work. So. <laughs> yeah. Well, that makes a lot of sense. Again, you're dealing with young kids who are exceptional athletes, uh, but uh, I mean, inexperienced with life and everything else. And you're dealing with big contracts. You're dealing with really, really smart people. Yeah. You're dealing with teams and the people that negotiate for those teams. And they do that shit for a living. And, you know, coming from someone who's done sales for as long as I have, you walk into a sales negotiation and you don't know what you're doing. Mm. They're going to, they're going to, they're going to fuck you. You're you're not going to know what's going on. So having someone experienced makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Is that happening a lot? Are there a lot of players that aren't represented and they're getting fucked in deals? Or is there a lot of bad agents too that don't get good deals? I think, I think it goes back to education and what the agents are telling them. It's expectations. So there's a lot of athletes out there, even elite, elite players right now in free agent contract years that I've that they've reached out to me um, and not necessarily, unfortunately, not necessarily to sign them, but they respect me. I, I'm, re- I'm respectable enough to where I keep it real with them. And yeah. so I have a reputation of, of at least keeping it real. And and what happens, what agents get into trouble with is, is setting expectation to such a point where they fall short of those expectations and really piss off the player. Oh, yeah. And so that's where uh, it's a visceral discontent when the player is being told one thing <laughs> and being promised a hundred million dollars and only, and the, and the best contract offer out there is a million that's a problem. And so their response to that is fuck the agents. Fuck that. I don't need it. Mm. Sure. Sure. So being honest has got to be a big part of what. what do. What's the name of the famous agent, dude? The guy that gets everybody the fucking house. Yes. Yeah. I got to fight with that dude once. Okay. So tell me that. <laughs> what, what, what <laughs> is, what, what is the difference? Uh, well, I, I, yeah. Well, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I do want to hear that too. That. I do. I do want to hear that. Well, you're, I want you to talk about him right here. I, Cause what I want to know is, what makes a guy like to that crazy level? What separates you and him? Uh, number one, he's married to the game, and, and and he promotes that right. So there, there's this. He's he's done a, a fascinating job of promoting himself as being laser sharp in athlete representation only. Athlete representation is his life. He doesn't want to do anything else. Um, and he's done a good job there. Number two, he works his ass off and grinds. Like he's he's out in the parking lot and 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 telling players they should be getting more money. And he's he's out there working. <laughs> you know, he's working. Still, so, what? It's, oh yeah, he's still, dude. He's got minions all over the place now. You know, oh, wow. his team Rosenhaus. There's minions everywhere. Um, and so he's done a great job of branding himself. You know, and and all it takes is is one elite guy really, and you do a good deal with them, and 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 the, and the people come in. You know, the players come in droves. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's what tends to happen now. It's, it's like the CAAs of the world. Like 
you know, they've done a great job of branding themselves. Um, it, it, CA is one of the top uh, sports agencies or, or athlete and talent agencies out there. And what they've done is it's almost, they've set up almost a franchise type model, right? CAA is the brand. And then they hire, I think maybe they have 25 or 30 NFL agents now under their, under their hub. And that agent can say, I'm with CAA. And, and not a lot of, look, a lot of these guys are coming from a social economically depressed background. They didn't go to class. They, they don't, they don't necessarily care. They, they, they could, I mean, a, almost all of them are, you know, have some measure of, of, uh, of, of, of intelligence, but at the same time, they just eat the brand, they eat the brand. And mm. so that, that's what happens. So Rosenhaus has done a great job of uh, branding himself in, in a certain way. So why'd you get in a fight with him? A uh, fucker. <laughs> <laughs> so this is, it goes back. back to Chris Brown. So, uh, that running back I was talking mm. about, uh, with Tennessee, he, uh, I mean, Chris was, he was, he was, a, should have made, you know, a lot of money. Of course he got hurt that year, but in his year where he was balling. So Zach, Zach Pillar, was a was a lineman. Was one, and obviously, the running oh, backs are very close. Your guy, right? Yeah, the running backs are very close with linemen. All agents know that, right? So if you have a lineman, so what he would do is Pillar would put Rosenhaus on the on the speakerphone, and Rosenhaus and uh, Chris would be sitting next to Rose, no, not oh, next to his wow. teammate, and Rosenhaus would be spitting game to Chris. Chris, your agent doesn't know what he's doing. Oh, and meanwhile, you know, Chris, like sharks nipping at my toes. When I don't know, I'm thinking about going to the shark. They call him the shark. His nickname's the shark, right? Oh wow. So I fucking I I get livid. I call so I call Rosenhaus. I'm like motherfucker. If I ever hear you fucking talk through Zach Pillar. To talk to Chris, I'm gonna beat your ass the next time we're at the combine because everybody I have to go to the combine tomorrow. Everybody goes to the combine; it's a horrible experience. But all the agents are there, right? <laughs> and so, dude, if you ever like, if you ever talk to me, I'm gonna beat your well. And he goes, "Well, I don't mean to break up a happy home. I'm not a home wrecker." I'm like, "Damn right, you're not a home wrecker." <laughs> so no, it didn't get physical, but that, that's okay. A, yeah, yeah. They sorry, call, sorry to disappoint you. The oh, combine, the combine sucks. I've always wanted to go, dude. Oh, dude, is it, is it boring or what? What's the deal? It is so bad. First of all, it's in fucking Indianapolis. Um, which in the winter is just freezing cold. I don't like cold. Yeah. So I, I don't like cold. So I don't like being cold. Number two, if <laughs> talk about the most concentrated uh, area of testosterone, all male driven oh, yeah. testosterone for like four to six days, it, it's it's the NFL combine. Really? I mean, well, yeah, everybody's competitive. Yeah. Look, as an agent, you have to be competitive. You're you're look. There's only 1,900. So a top agent, a top 10 percent agent, has three clients. Right? There's 1,900 uh, players, and there's like. 2000 agents, <laughs> mm. right? Oh, there's wow. licensed agents that, that, you know, don't have players. There's stuff all the time. Is there certain areas on the field or anything you guys are all fighting for to get access or anything like that? Um, not, not at the combine, but yeah. what, it used to be a lot worse because there used to be absolutely no tampering rules at all. Um, and nothing established. So you'd you'd see fist fights all the time with other agents because they're really? trying to steal the guys. Yeah. It, it gets, it gets crazy. Yeah, I can wow. Imagine. Yeah. Wow, that's insane. Well, you're talking about millions of dollars that someone's yeah, fucking exactly. I mean, he, yeah. he plucks a Chris Brown out of your pocket Dude, like that, that. Yeah. I, I mean, a, Good money with Chris. Yeah. Yeah. That's bread on the table. How, and how agents typically get paid a percentage of, I'm assuming, the contracts that they sign. So they're yeah, in, so they're in, they're, they're, your success is directly tied to the success of your client. Absolutely. It, and it's, it's, it's guided by the, the collective bargaining agreement. So an NFL agent on the contract, player contract side, you make, you can make anywhere from one to 3%. Mm. Uh, but then on, on marketing, you can, it depends. I think the market is around 10 to 15. You can charge as much as, what do you, charge mean, as, much as you want. What do you mean on marketing? Like, uh, explain that. So you distinguish, uh, you distinguish agency, um, from the contract, the player contract, the actual negotiated contract you have with the team yeah. with marketing deals. Oh, okay. oh I see. You distinguish so that. You get a percentage of the team and then there's a greater percentage with marketing. Right. Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So when we see like the ticker come up on ESPN and we see someone just sign for a $50 million deal, can we guesstimate like what the agent's probably making oh, off of that? Well, no, not based on the ticker no. because you have to look at what the guaranteed money was. Oh, okay. Uh, that matters because, more. Uh, yeah. Because a lot of the agents, once you, uh, once you're seasoned, you, you, a couple things, you develop a great relationship with the media, uh, because of some of the stories that I, that I talked about. And what you also negotiate, you try to have a decent relationship with the teams, although it doesn't always work out because what they'll do is they'll they'll pad the contract so you look good in the media, uh, right? So mm. yeah, it might have been a fifty million deal, fifty million dollar deal, but it was ten million guaranteed. It was a five year deal, and there's no fucking way that player's seen the last three or four years of that deal. Oh wow, hmm. no fucking way. Is that common? Yes. Why? Why? I don't understand. Is it because they get traded, hurt? I mean, all the above. All, all the above make so it's so from a team's perspective, happy employee. Happy employee, they see, they think they can grab the fifty million, right? It's competitive because you want to continue to try to get that contract money. Uh, from the agent's perspective, you want to you want to provide the perception that you did this monster deal, 
right? And so, so it's a it's a lot about that. Oh wow, yeah, oh, that's really interesting. So, so then, okay, so let's say it is a, a ten million, you know, guarantee or whatever. You said they won't see the last three, four years. What would that look like in the in the in the hands of the agent? Well, in terms of what what they're gathering, so three yeah. percent of ten million, oh, so okay. like thirty times, so three hundred grand. Is that right? Oh, that's not bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's not bad. And it's a big it, deal, though. Right, and for an agent, is it is that upfront money for you right away, or do so, you have to get that over his? So contract? that's interesting. So uh, signing bonus, any Aaron guaranteed when the the general rule is when the player gets paid, you can you can bill right. So guaranteed money like a signing bonus, you can bill immediately. And then during the season, players get paid 17 weeks over the year. Unfortunately, I wish it could be like 34 or 52. I think it would help them. But right now they get all paid in, within the season. So you can bill as long as they get the money. Mm. Okay. And is it common for you to do that, to like stretch it out to help a player out? Or I, I tend to try to, to bill at, in December. Actually, just one, bi- one bill. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, yeah. nice. Yeah. Good well, shit, dude. Very interesting, dude. Yeah, yeah. yeah. very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Good I'll, time, good time hanging out. Man. A, lot, a lot of fun on this podcast. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Some good yeah. stories. Yeah. Yeah. Good, good we'll catch see how it. much of it we can air. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> good, good catching up, bro. Yeah, thank right you, on. man.